Hello, welcome everybody to the next lecture um, of the Advanced Deep Learning for Computer Vision course. In the last lecture, we have talked the first time about generative models. Um, specifically, we've been talking for quite a while um, about GANs, generative adversarial networks. And today I would like to continue the discussion. And the first thing I would like to talk about are common GAN architectures. And there's, of course, a large variety of different architectures. Um, we have seen a couple of them already. We have seen the DC GAN, the deep convolutional GAN. That's a very well basic architecture. That's a good starting point. Whenever you're starting to train a GAN, um, this is probably one of the architectures you would like to get started with. However, there are many architectures, of course, um, and by no means I can go over all of them. And one important concept about GANs I would like to address, though, is how do you scale them up to bigger resolutions? So the challenges for most parts is that a GAN can generate very well the distribution locally. And I mean, that's kind of obvious because we're having um, convolutional kernels and these convolutional kernels have always a local context. There's a receptive field. Um, and locally speaking, they can help you to produce good detail. But a global structure is is pretty challenging for GANs, and this problem becomes even more challenging when the resolution of the images um, becomes higher. And this traditionally, you know, since people have been playing around with GANs and there has been a lot of research, was one of the core challenges, how do you generate high resolution images? And one of the things um, that people have been adopting is very related to, to multi-scale optimization. So what people are doing, um, there is like the optimizing a, a problem on, on different scales and then using the respective initializations for the next level. And this is something that and people are doing for GANs as well. In this case, uh, what you can do is you can, you can start here and um, basically on a low resolution. So the idea is you have, uh, you have a, a generator. In this case here, it takes random variable Z, here's input, right? Generates a low resolution image. Um, it then upsamples that one. It has another generator that adds some detail now um, on top of that image. Um, it upsamples again, adds more detail on it, adds more detail on it and so on. And what you have here is you basically have multiple scales of generations, right? You have one generator here, G3, takes random vector Z as input, G2, G1, and G0. And the idea is that you essentially have the structure give them at the lower levels and then you have a learnable upsam you have an upsampling and then you have a learnable um, another learnable generator that adds the detail to that in order to match that resolution. I'm not arguing here about the specific quality of these images. Again keep in mind that these image th this this work has been already published five years ago. So this was still at, in the beginning phases and you know, um, GANs have been um, developed much further by now. Um, but the core idea is still very relevant, right? You, you basically go ahead, you generate things at a lower resolution first with a generator that sees kind of the global context, but it doesn't know about the diesel so much, right? So that's what this guy here is doing. And then you can upsample, 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 and eventually um, you're going to get a higher resolution image. Um, now, the idea here is, of course, we have a lot of generators. In this case, we had four different generators. What we want to do is we also want to have a discriminator at every level. And the idea is pretty straightforward, right? We're doing the same thing what we've done for the generators. Um, and we're just saying, oh, this image that has been generated here, right? Sorry, <laughs> the, the image that has been generated here um, is being discriminated. The image that has been generated here is being discriminated and so on, right? So at every resolution, you're going to have um, a discriminator. So we have here G0, G1, G2, G3. And we're going to have discriminators, D0, D1, D2, and D3, um, that can do the discrimination at every level. And that is exactly doing what I've said is basically here um, you're discriminating, oh, is that, um, is that detail enough? And here is basically more is the structure enough. So you, you have different ways to do that. Um, this specific paper here by Denton et al, what they're doing is they're doing the discrimination essentially um, on these uh, delta images. Um, you can do it this way, you can also do it on the original images. So there have been verbs that do it either way. Um, but I think the core concept, what's very important about this one is I feel, you can actually um, do this at different scales. And because of that, you have the advantage that you can force the network to focus either on global structure, 
on the coarser levels, right? Or you can focus on the fine scale detail. And again, I mentioned that these images might, might be not too impressive at this point, but again, be aware this is a paper that was published five years ago. But the reason why I'm mentioning it, many of the recent works have actually built up on that. And one of the very notable works is the progressive growing GANs. Um, this was a paper that NVIDIA published in 2017, and it has a very, very similar concept. And here you can already see that these images are already much, much, much higher quality. Um, in fact, this was one of the papers where people thought, hmm, yeah, GANs, okay, they don't quite work so well. Um, and then these guys published the paper and then it realized, okay, it looks pretty good. Okay, there's still a, a way to get GANs to work. Um, it doesn't make the, the GAN training a lot easier, but there's at least, um, there's like proof that you can, this experimental validation that you can actually generate very good images. Um, and the idea of this paper is very similar to the previous one, except they don't keep all the multi-scale discriminators and generators around in the same way, but they naturally grow both generator and discriminator at the same time. So what they do, um, they have a generator here that goes from a latent code, generates a four by four image, gives you, gives you an image, four by four, right? It's um, straightforward, it has 16 pixels. Um, you have a discriminator here, um, and it checks if this four by four image is real or is it not real. And you train this for a while um, until you get a reasonable distribution here. And of course, four by four, you won't see a whole lot, right? But assuming you train this on faces, um, you actually, um, yeah, you can train this um, much easier than if you have a high quality image because um, the distribution here is much easier to satisfy. Now, once this generator and this discriminator is trained jointly and quote unquote produces good results, um, then what you do is you expand your network. So what you do is you take the generator and you append another layer here in the middle and or another block of layers um, for the discriminator, you do the same thing. You also append another block here. So the resolution here in the middle becomes eight by eight instead of four by four. Um, but the core idea is that these lower resolution or these, these, these networks, um, these four by four and the four by four generator and discriminator, these ones, they're actually gonna stay there for a second. So the network, this bigger network now is being initialized with the pre-trained version of these ones. And then the whole network here is trained jointly. So the idea is in a sense that, oh, this four by four um, generator produced kind of reasonable results. This four by four generator was kind of okay at discriminating four by four images. Um, let's have another, um, let's have another upsampling block basically. And then we're getting eight by eight images. And the idea is of course that um, this stabilizes the training a lot, right? Because you have already network weights in the lower resolutions um, that knows how to generate the global structure. Uh, and then it produces kind of the fine scale detail later on. And this is being actually, this, this training process, this progressive growing training process is being repeated until you end up at 1024 squared images. So it goes, goes basically to HD images almost, right? Um, and it takes, of course, a long time, right? Instead of having a single training process, you now have many, many training processes at every resolution. Um, however, each training process is already being initialized with the previous layers, right? So, um, yeah, that is, that is, uh, yeah, that is one, <laughs> One interesting thing, so basically, yes, you have more training processes, but each training process in principle takes not so much time because you already have good initializations in the first layers. Um, yeah, so they train this. Um, they basically have a fixed schedule when to append the next layer. Um, and at the end of the day, they can actually produce pretty good results. I want to go quickly into a few details here. Um, so one thing that is not so easy to understand is what, how do you append this? So what's important is that you append or expand the network, um, both generate and discriminate at the same time. Of course, if the generator gets bigger, I also need a bigger discriminator. Now, that is something you have to be very careful how to do that. Um, but let's have a look at the quick details. So the generator in this case, um, it's a four by four conf, uh, sorry, it's a four by four image that you're generating. Um, you're taking this four by four image, um, this is actually a feature map right now. This is an important thing, um, what they do. Like the problem, what you're gonna do is you're not actually, this four by four network here is not generating an image by itself. But what it's doing, it's actually generating a feature set. And then what you do is you have an, a, a two RGB layered, so to say, which is basically 
a series of one by one convolutions, it's actually three one by one convolutions, right? Um, that converts these features here into an RGB image. Um, and now this RGB image is the output of, of the generator at this four by four resolution. Now, the advantage of that is when you're now appending the next block, you're simply doing an upsampling here and having the eight by eight blocks here. But now you're not taking the RGB values here where you upsample, but rather you're taking the features of this four by four block that you upsample. And then again, once you have here a feature map, you're doing another two RGB operator um, and you're getting the eight by eight image, right? So the core idea is you actually can maintain the feature maps here, but you can still have a two RGB operator that gets you um, at the current resolution to the RGB image, right? And you do this for four by four, you do it by uh, for eight by eight, and so on. You just do it all the way down in this, in this uh, multi-scale hierarchy. Um, the second thing what you're doing now is, um, let's say we train this part here first, the four by four part, and we are pending like this part here afterwards. Um, this would be a very rapid change, right? And the problem would be um, that suddenly you're getting a whole new loss and this whole new loss um, is, gonna, is gonna potentially destabilize your training process. So, um, what these guys are doing, um, they're suggesting, oh, let's do a linear crossfade. So we don't just have a, like a harsh transition here, but we have a linear crossfade between how to take the losses from here and how to take the losses from here. And then you just gradually, you gradually include this part for training basically, right? Um, so this helps you a lot because then it's not like a, oh, now suddenly we have like another layer and we kind of um, make the training very unstable, but you, you like step by step, you're getting um, more weight uh, to the higher resolution, right? And, and yeah, and then you basically, you continue that, right? Um, you go to the next level, you go to the next level and so on. Uh, the discriminator is trained in the exact, is, is doing exact same thing, right? And the discriminator, you just have, um, you have a from RGB operator that basically takes this image again, goes to an eight by eight feature map, down samples it, four by four, and so on, right? But same idea. Um, so there's two key concepts. You, you, you can't just append another layer um, to the, you can't just generate an RGB image and then upsample the RGB image. But rather than that, you wanna take the feature maps. And the second thing is, you actually want to go ahead and, um, uh, yeah, you actually wanna, wanna go ahead and, and do this linear crossfade that makes like a smooth transition, right? You have a linear blending function basically uh, between the two levels. Yeah, that's the, that's the core idea. But the principle of the GAN is still very similar uh, to before. Um, and the nice thing is with that now you can train it and you have a relatively stable process to produce high resolution results or relatively high resolution results. Um, so let's have a look at the training process here. Um, this is the, the training process that is being visualized here. Um, so here we have, uh, yeah, we have here uh, the progressive growing shown on the right hand side. Um, and here we have the, 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 the final resolution as the output, right? So here we see it's still relatively low resolution, now comes the next level, now comes another level, and so on. And you see it's getting, you know, it's getting sharper and sharper and sharper, the training process is a little bit funky, but as you continue training, um, it gets better and better. And this is an output here um, above the 34 hours, uh, 35 hours of training. Um, you have to be aware this is a network they train, I think, on a DGX, which is um, an eight GPU high-end machine. So there's actually quite some computational effort behind it in order to produce these results. But you can already see, well, I mean, the results here, they look actually pretty decent, right? Um, sure, you have some artifacts like here, but globally speaking, you're actually getting, um, you're getting very, very, very good results here. Um, what is interesting, once you have trained that network, the really cool thing is you have this manifold that you got, right? So you can go from latent space to an image. And what's fun about it is when you're training again and you train it successfully, you can take this latent space and interpolate in this latent space in order to, you know, kind of do all kind of funky operations. Um, and this is what these guys have been doing here too. Um, so they um, do 1024 times 1024 resolutions output and now they do linear interpolations in the latent space. And it's kind of funny like how the transitions between one and another image happens here. Uh, but again, these are simply take a bunch of random vectors, right? And then like interpolate um, and uh, traverse the latent space here. 
and it's kind of mesmerizing how um, how how things transition uh, between the different between the different photos of people. Um, you can also see, of course, not everything is perfect. Um, so you see, for instance, here when you look at the hair, like this part on the side is always always a bit tricky, like how they grow hair and so on, how the mouth changes, right? Um, but it's pretty impressive compared to all the previous GAN papers we have seen. This is one of the papers that you know showed really viable results at a higher resolution than most other papers have been showing before. Admittedly, they did use a lot of GPUs, um, but I think the results look pretty stunning. So I'm, I'm a big fan of this paper because it also has a nice kind of intuition behind it. Like they use this multi-scale training, right? Um, and and they, they can grow the network and can do this kind of classical multi-scale optimization um, what people typically use. All right. So I wanted to show you a couple of these results just to see what is possible with current GANs. Um, of course, we can't cover all the GAN papers right now in this lecture. Um, there's a lot of variations, right? Um, what I would like you to, to understand is a bit more is like, what are the trends, right? What can you do? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of different things in terms of the loss functions. And the one thing is, I don't think the loss functions make the biggest difference. I mean, most people still use a heuristic loss or a Wasserstein loss. These are the two kind of dominant losses that have so far emerged, I think. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of papers that do different losses, um, but in practice, I think they don't make such a big difference. Um, the, the, the big challenge is still that the, the GANs are really hard to evaluate, right? I mean, of course, if you see a result like this one from the progressive GAN, um, you're going to get pretty, it's pretty impressive, right? It's like, this is, you know, what an AI can generate today. Um, it's not too bad. And one of the big challenges that is always hidden in research papers is there's of course a lot of engineering that went into the respective hyperparameter optimization. Um, and I wanted to say a few things about that one is basically, um, for instance, the progressive GAN paper, right? They proposed this nice theoretically progressive growing and they, at this time, um, they produced the best results. Um, but one thing is also clear, right? They spend a lot of engineering efforts, for instance, on the data. They created a new data set just specifically, you know, to make the training work here. And by new data set, you have to basically make sure that the images are all relatively aligned, that the nose and the eye regions are relatively aligned, and they have a specific procedure how to generate the data, um, and so on. So there's a lot of data engineering also going into that in order to produce good results. And that is a very, um, a very, very important um, yeah, thing that, that is worthwhile looking at. Um, of course, when you're reading a research paper, one thing I would like you to do is be a bit cautious about it. Like what made, what made the big breakthrough happen? And there was a pretty funny paper actually. Um, this was from Google Brain. Um, and what these guys said is basically, um, well, the paper is called Are GANs Created Equal? And what they did is they just ran an evaluation um, on a bunch of different GAN methods. And what they found is the loss functions design choices and stuff like that didn't matter too much. So, um, well, to say it a bit more provocative is basically, it didn't really matter what GAN you used, as long as you knew how to optimize it, um, you always could produce good results. You know, some were harder to optimize, some were easy to optimize, some were more prone to, to mod collapse and stuff like that, others were less prone. But in principle, all these GAN papers kind of could do the same thing. Um, and that, that led us to the interesting question, do we have a fundamental way of, of training GANs, right? And I did try in the last video, um, in the last lecture video, try to tell you a little bit what the GAN tricks are, right? What people can do. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, we have to be very clear. It is still very, very tricky to train the GANs. And by tricky, what that means in practice is often you train it, it just collapses and you don't know why, or it just doesn't produce better results. So you don't know why. Then you, you, you change some stuff like learning rate. Um, it still doesn't get better, right? That's kind of the... The, the thing what happens when I'm saying, oh, it's hard to train. Um, there's, again, there's a lot of theories now behind it, but practically it's still very, very difficult um, to train GANs. Good, um, so I hope I gave you um, a reasonable overview of you know, what current GANs are and kind of the, the high level trends of GAN architectures. Um, the one thing what we have been doing now is, we have been always assuming we have a fully generative model, meaning that we have a latent vector z, and from this latent vector z, we want to create an image. Um, we have only focused on the image domain, we will later focus on other things. 
Um, but the one thing I would like to talk about right now is the conditional case. Um, conditional generative adversarial networks, um, this doesn't count only for GANs. In principle, you want to have a conditional case for all generative models because you would like to have some control of the input, right? I just don't want to have a single latent vector Z that is just giving me a random variable, tell me, oh, here's a great image. That's not so interesting. But what's more interesting is if you can actually use these GANs for real-world applications. And there's modeling applications such as give me a sketch, make a real image out of it, all right? Add semantic meaning to the manifold, um, generate me specific faces um, that smile, that laugh, that, you know, have a certain appearance, certain shadow, certain reflection, stuff like that. Um, and I think without these kind of additional controls, the GANs are not so useful. So we have to figure out um, how to input that in order to, to make them useful for their respective purposes. And, and this is what conditional GANs are. So the big question is, how do we make them conditional? Um, the second thing is, is domain transfer. Um, for instance, you have like labels you want to transfer. Um, that's very relevant for, for training standard networks. Domain transfer is still a very tricky and challenging story. We have to see if we have time uh, in this class or whether I, I want to fit it in or not. Um, but that's also a similar thing, right? If you have images from day and um, you want to transfer them to the night and then you want to train yourself to car in it, that is also a case where you would want to have a conditional again. Uh, but for now, we want to talk more about modeling things, um, which I think is pretty interesting um, for, you know, entertainment industry and stuff like that. Um, there's, of course, a lot of uh, yeah, cool things happening. In, in that space, especially in the last few years, we had we had tremendous progress there. Now, what we have done, um, and I'm basically just reiterating um, in the last lecture, is we have training data, right? And with this training data, we're training a manifold. And this manifold means, oh, give me random vector z from this random vector z, draw samples and generate images out of it, right? Uh, and this is what the GAN manifold is giving us. So this manifold is kind of spanning Ideally, <laughs> um, it's representing a distribution um, of real-world images. And these images are taken from the training set. Of course, they're not all kinds of real-world images. This is only the domain uh, we did fit or we did put into our, in our training set. Um, yeah, what we haven't done so far is we haven't thought about what do any of the variables in Z, how do they impact the image generation process? Uh, we saw it a little bit in the progressive growing GANs, right? When you do this GAN interpolation, you go from one image to another image. Um, you get different images in between, you get these transitions, uh, but there's no semantic meaning yet behind it, right? There's no like, oh, um, yeah, I want to <laughs> I wanna generate a person with blonde hair. I want to generate a person with longer hair. Um, I want to change the gender and stuff like that, right? These kind of things, um, they're probably somewhere in this manifold, maybe. But we never explicitly enforce them. If they are there, they have been there because of the data distributions. Um, and we also never leveraged it so far. So we didn't try to force it, oh, make this hair blonde or something like that. Um, um, but what we love to do is something like that, actually. right? We would love to go ahead and say, oh, yeah, we, we're going to have manifold. Uh, we're going to have latent codes. We have A, B, C. So we have, um, we have images here, a set of images with sunglasses. We have male images without sunglasses, we have female images um, without sunglasses. And ideally, we would like to do some sort of um, latent space vector arithmetic, which is kind of, you know, we have kind of, oh, we know there's some semantic meaning in the image, we just don't quite know how to express it. But if we said, oh, we want to have this type of image with sunglasses, um, which is A, right? So we want to have sunglasses. We subtract male from it. So we make it kind of neutral. And then we add um, the female face to it. We would like to get, um, you know, a female face with sunglasses out of it. Right? That's kind of the, the high level idea. Um, you can already see, well, the result here looks okay-ish. <laughs> I should say, again, this is a little bit of an older paper. Um, I'm not talking about high quality manifolds here, right? Um, again, you could argue, oh, if we had a better manifold, we trained this longer, we would probably get higher quality outputs. But in fact, this manifold training is pretty difficult when we want to add these kind of um, arithmetic operators, semantic operations, and so on. So, yeah, that is unfortunately um, a very, very tricky problem.
but it's also super interesting, right? If you're saying, oh, we have kind of all this manipulation efforts, um, like what Photoshop was doing by hand, right? We could kind of do by just saying, oh, we take a little bit of that image, a little bit of that image, and then we get a, a photorealistic output, right? Um, here we see, um, yeah, another example of again manifold, right? Here we see basically, oh, we can get images with and without sunglasses by that, right? So we can take these tricks uh, to get to get some results here. Um, yeah, if you're going further, um, I already mentioned this part in the progressive GANs when we do latent space interpolation, right? So what we can do is we have a latent code Z0, we have a latent code Z1, and we just linearly interpolate between that latent code and generate all the images in between. That was what, what they have been doing when they, they interpolate between the faces together, right? Um, and it's just a linear interpolation. So you just have Z, Z0, Z1, right? And you just do this linear interpolation and you can generate all the intermediate images as output. Now, for semantics, this is kind of interesting already because if I have something attached to this one, right? And if I have some labels attached to this one, I know how to interpolate between the labels. If you're getting good intermediate results, that will depend on the manifold, right? This depends how you train it and so on. So that's still... Um, yeah, you can ignore it, of course. Um, that's what these guys have been doing here. Um, they get something, but you see already, uh, oh yeah, okay, the, there's not too much control in it yet, right? Also, again, the, the quality here is still relatively low. This was a paper from 2015. This was a, from, from um, uh, the Redford paper. It's a very popular paper. If you don't know it, have a look. Um, and yeah, the quality is not so high. Again, you could argue if you had like progressive growing and these kind of things, you would get better results. But for simplicity, what's interesting to us right now is how can we deal um, with these latent codes? This is one thing you can do to interpolations. Um, but still at this point, we still don't have any conditioning, right? We still, we generate stuff from a random code, um, but we don't, the generator doesn't know about anything we want to tell them. The only thing we want to do is we want to say, oh, Here's, here's a latent code, produce an image. Now, conditional GANs, in a sense, what we would love to do, instead of having a random code, we would like to take some condition as input. So let's say we want to take an input image of a cat here that is a sketch. I would love, love to use a generator that generates an output image. Um, and then the discriminant tells me, hey, this is a real image. You, you've done great. So, but what I would love to do is I would love to have some correlation between what I put in and what I generate as output, right? So in other words, in this case, I would love to have these sketches of the cat and I would like to get the cat, the, the real world image of the cat as an output. And yeah, that's what the conditional GAN should do for us. And you know, you could, you could design an architecture like that, which is relatively straightforward. Uh, we could go ahead and say, well, we're feeding in this image, maybe have an encoder first, we get a latent space out of that one. And then we have a decoder, which is our generator, right? Um, that generates a real output image. And then we have a discriminator that tells me, is it a real image or not, right? Um, so I can design a network like that. Um, and you can train the network like that. Um, in practice, what you will get is, um, you will run into a simple problem. And the simple problem is, this discriminator here just tells you, is it a real cat or not? it doesn't tell you any correlation to this one here. So if my generator now decides, I'm gonna generate a different output image, my discriminator would still say it's a real image, which is great. Um, however, <laughs> um, the output image is real, but it doesn't have anything to do with the input. So you can try this very simple case here. Um, in this case, you will quickly realize that this input is pretty much being ignored. Um, it's just, being used to create like a random initialization or random vector Z, but the semantics or the content here will most likely be ignored because the discriminator doesn't know about this input image, right? So that's a, that's a challenge why you can't just design a conditional GAN like that. You can't just go ahead and say, oh, we're gonna take this as input here and the generator and then generate an output because there's no guarantee that these two things have anything um, to do with each other. So, I'm gonna start with one of the first verbs in that space. And um, this is still very relevant, even though it was trained on a very simple manifold. And the idea is, what we would love to do is we would like to take a photo and we would love, love to figure out a latent space Z by basically projecting this photo onto the manifold that we have learned with again. 
Um, this is called an IGAN paper, Interactive GANs. Um, it was a, oh, this is still a very popular paper. It was published in 2016. Um, and this photo here can be projected onto the, onto the manifold by saying, oh, what is the, what is the latent code Z that best, best express this image? And um, this is an operation, by the way, we will talk about right now a little bit. Um, and even though this was published in 2016, this is still super relevant today. This is what a lot of people do right now for manipulating latent spaces and so on. Um, but the idea is, well, if you could do that, I could go ahead and do some editing here, right? And I can basically modify the shoe size in this case and stuff like that. Um, I can, you know, do latent space manipulation, editing. Um, and then what I could do is I could basically figure out, oh, what did I change here in image space? And I'm going to, uh, yeah, re reproject this edit transfer on the original image. Um, what's, I mean, the reason why they do like this reprojection here is because at this point they didn't have strong enough manifolds here um, to produce photorealistic results. I mean, I want to talk about more about this step here. This step is more interesting right now. I mean, sure, you can back project the two and can um, use these operate. Basically, you can figure out like some sort of analogy, right? How was this image edited? You just edit it in the same way. And you can formulate this as a, as a nonlinear optimization problem. Um, I'll mention it briefly, but that's not the main part. I want to focus on this part here. I want to focus on how do we take an original photo? How do we project it on the manifold? And this is a very interesting operator because the question what we have now is we have a real image X, we have a pre-trained GAN. So the manifold is fixed right now, right? I'm not training the GAN. GAN is, GAN is, GAN is given to me. I have trained a GAN from a random variable Z that produces um, a certain output, right? Um, what you want to do is you want to go ahead and say, give me for this waterfall image, give me the latent code Z. And the way you can do this is you can formulate as an optimization. So you can say, well, let's say we have an, a reconstruction loss L here. We have a generative model G. We have a random vector Z. This is our optimization variable. This is what we're trying to find. And this is our real image, right? So I would like to figure out, find a generated image that is close to my query image, find the respective or the optimal Z for that. Right. Again, this is the generative model, this is pre-trained. I'm not training the generative model here. Um, and then I have a reconstruction loss, which is you know an L1 loss or so, an L2 loss, whatever uh, you want to use. I'm not arguing this is the best loss here, but this is just something you can use uh, for, for simplicity. And again, this is an optimization that tries to minimize, tries to find a Z that minimizes the distance um, between the generated image and the query image. And this is what this one is doing here, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm feeding in this waterfall here. I'm optimizing, this is, a, I don't know, like a Gauss Newton optimizer or so, whatever they used. Um, and you're gonna get a, a, a latent code Z. And if you generated the image with Z, you're gonna get an image that looks like that. Um, and I think these ones are the distance metrics. So this is like 0.196 um, away from the original image. Um, same thing, query image, generate target, query image, generate target. And this is kind of cool, right? So now we have a pre-trained network and what we can do is we can find with an optimization procedure, we can try to find what is the closest query image, uh, what is the best optimal Z um, and project this image onto the manifold, right? Um, yeah, it turns out neural networks are quite highly nonlinear. Um, well, this is a thing, of course, by design choice, um, but it turns out this optimization here is actually very much nonlinear. And whenever we have optimizations on nonlinear and we don't know how to solve them properly because you could argue, well, these ones don't look so similar. Maybe we didn't find the right global optimum here. Maybe we can find a better optimization procedure. Um, well, we could think about making the optimization better um, or we could do the naive thing um, and say, oh, we don't use an optimization at all anymore. We just train a neural network does the same job for us. And this is the alternative way. Um, in this case, what you want to do is you would like to train a neural network P and this network P takes the input image and predicts a latent vector Z, right? Um, well, how do you get that? Well, um, you in fact can just generate this training data for free for you because 
originally when you train your manifold, um, you 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 basically feed or when you have latent variable z, right? You know the ground truth pairs because so this network is easy to train because all you're doing is you're feeding in random random variable z, generating some stuff as output, and then what you're training is you're training the opposite network, so you're inverting the network and saying, oh, now for this z, what was the sorry for this x, what is the z you fed in, right? And I can train an arbit if I have a pre-trained network, um, a pre-trained GAN network, I can generate this training pairs pretty much for free, right? I just feed in random variable Z, random, 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 generate images, and then I'm training a network that takes the images and produces the respective Zs uh, as output, right? So I have Z is the ground truth for my given input uh, X, right? Um, and these two things do the same thing, right? Right? Um, and in this case, what we're doing then is, um, instead of using this optimization, um, what we're doing is we're using this network to do that for us. So we're feeding in the network here um, that produces the Z, and then we, we're just generating the respective output, right? Um, in this case, we're getting results that look like these ones. Oh yeah, Th this one is, uh, it's a simple autoencoder with a fixed uh, decoder G, right? When you train it, like the G is fixed. Um, that's the thing, right? You're training the whole thing then, um, and that's very straightforward. And um, now what you can do is, you, you can just do, uh, take take the image X here again, get a Z as output, and you're gonna get some target uh, here, right? And you see already, well, if you do that, um, you're getting kind of similarish results. Sometimes looks a bit better, sometimes looks a little bit worse. And you see the distances here are also well, relatively, relatively similar. So we didn't necessarily get better results here, um, but we got an alternative way. And if you're doing these two things, um, you will see that this Z and the um, and the, the Z you would get here, um, they're actually quite different. So even though they produce similar results, uh, you're still getting different Zs. So what they have done then is said, well, you know, inverting the network gets you kind of into the right local minima, and then you do a fine tuning optimization afterwards. And this is kind of this hybrid method. So you say use the network as an initialization, uh, use this one first, and then follow up by the optimization. And if you do that, you get actually quite better results, right? You see uh, now the error goes a little bit down from like 0.196 to 0.153 here, and you see the images match a little bit better. Um, I'm not arguing right now like how to weight this and how to precisely train this network here, but the, the key things I feel that are worthwhile remembering here is there's two options. We can go ahead and say, we give me an image and a fixed manifold that is pre-trained. I can optimize for Z with a standard classical optimization approach. I can also train a network that does the same thing by taking the data uh, that are generated beforehand. Um, and I can also combine these two things, right? And this is kind of gives you a bunch of tool sets how to go from one to the respective other, right? Okay, um, and I think this this part I feel is like super cool because now we can go ahead and we can uh, we can basically do um, yeah we can protect things on the manifold and this is what this editing operator is doing now and um, yeah I found this pretty cool uh, because now we can go ahead and use sketches to find latent variables z that match to the sketches right so so let's have a look um, we have here some sketches that we're gonna do now this is our guidance quote unquote and we then get latent code Z from that. And that produces our, um, our, our respective image. Um, the, the term here for the optimization is a little bit modified here. Um, in this case, what we're saying is, well, we have a generator, we have the user guidance here. This is, this is the guidance, right? the guidance vector. This is our sketch. We'll see this in a second, what this means. Um, uh, we have here our, our generative model, right? We have here some loss that compares these two images together, whatever we generated and whatever we, we compared here. Um, and this is our data term. So we want to make sure that whatever we're generating is close to what we have fed as input. Um, and now there's a manifold smoothness term saying that, oh, you initialized this whole thing with a C0. Let's say this is our initial vector um, that we used. Um, and then we're making some edits so we don't wildly jump back and forth in the manifold space, but we're saying, oh, stay relatively close to the original image and just do some local edits there. So we have a smooth traversal of the manifold, right? Um, yeah, this is our constraint violation loss. 
But now what we can do is we can have these guy strings, right? Now we can have, oh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and do some drawing. Um, more drawing here, right? More drawing here, more drawing here, um, more drawing here, more drawing here. And basically this is what you're getting as an output here. So you're still producing shoes. Um, why producing shoes? Our sketches don't look like it. Well, because our, um, uh, yeah, our, uh, our pre-trained uh, manifold is basically trained on shoes. So whatever we're feeding in here is, is going to produce shoes. But the manifold protection that we're doing with this optimization will now find like edits that quote unquote best reflect according to this loss function here, um, what, what we're doing uh, in terms of edits. Um, this loss function here, I mentioned it, you could take an L1 loss, you could take an L2 loss, you could also use feature losses like LXNet uh, features and stuff like that. There's a couple of variations. I'm not arguing for one or the other. Um, but I think what's cool about it is that with these sketches, you can now get this projection to the latent space Z and then you can do the edits. Um, yeah, I think this is very fascinating. And this is a thing that, again, this is a paper that has been published in 2016, but there's actually papers nowadays where they just use the exact same strategy but they may be using a bit of a better uh, manifold they trained, right? So that's something I feel that is like super cool, super interesting. Okay, um, yeah, this paper, this is the interesting thing I feel. Um, this paper also, did this other thing, what I mentioned, they go then, oh, they're learning these transitions here. So they're doing basically, if I go quickly back, they're doing this part of the user interaction, right? Um, and then what they do is they project, they, they're trying to form uh, a nonlinear optimization um, because they say, oh, well, these, these GAN generated edits, they're not looking perfect. But what you can do is you can learn how were these things edited um, and you can formulate an optimization problem to project these edits here on top of the uh, original images now. Um, I'm not, well, I may be explaining it very briefly, but the idea is, is relatively easy. So um, there's like this integral, it's gonna be discretized, of course. We're going to say, um, well, this is our input image that we want to manipulate. This is what our GAN gives us. Um, this is our target in the latent space Z. Um, these are our latent interpolations. Could be an edit, could be also a linear interpolation. For simplicity, this is a linear interpolation. Um, and, and, and now the idea is that how was this guy here edited to here? We just want to do the same edit to here, right? And again, same edit from here to here. Right, we want to do from here to here, and so on. And we're just gonna continue with through it. Um, and the way these these edits, like these arrows here, are being optimized with this term here. So there's a color regularization term, meaning that oh, the color should behave similarly. There's a spatial regularization term saying that this should be the distortion should be similar. And then there's a data term that says oh, the edits you're applying from here to here um, had an operator um, that should be applied in the same way from here. Uh, again, this is maybe not the core of the learning part right now, but you can see how you can kind of um, clearly combine um, learning techniques um, on this end, and then you would would, would also be able to reproject them to, to the actual edits. Um, but again, I want to say this, in my opinion, is still an artifact that the GAN results here are not so, so perfect at this point. If we had perfect results here at this point, we could go ahead and didn't need this step because everything here would be already photorealistic. This is actually our main final goal. Um, as a community, we're not quite there yet, right? It's still like, it's still tricky, but um, that's that's our, our final goal at the end of the day. Um, but nonetheless, I think this paper was really cool and it's still really cool um, because they, they, they did this manifold protection. This is something I really liked about this paper. So they have these uh, user edits here, right? Um, they have these sketches and then they can generate various images here uh, as output. Um, yeah, and the nice thing is also this, this kind of stuff worked interactively. Um, and so, you know, they had a live demo, which kind of looked cool. Um, yeah, here's another example. Here's again, original inputs. Here's the reconstruction via optimization. This projection, what I just mentioned, this is via the network, and this is the hybrid one. Um, they look similar in a sense, um, but the hybrid one consistently give lower error. That's, you know, why they used it at the end of the day. Good. Um, yeah, let's have a look at the interactive part again. Um, this was, I think, something I liked a lot. So what they did now is they have this user interface, right? They have some sketches here. Um, and here you see the, the intermediate 
uh, result that the networks would do, right? And now you can go ahead and interpolate between the source and the target with their with the optimization. This is what the network is doing, and this is what they see here is then the reprojection uh, with this optimization. So pretty cool. Was done 2016, quite a while ago in in modern ages. That's already an eternity, um, but. Um, these these concepts still exist, right? So this idea of projecting back to the latent space is still super, super relevant today. And we will use it later on. Um, and I'll show you a couple of examples uh, with with things like, um, yeah, progressive GANs and so on. Good. Um, I should mention though, um, like mapping in latent space is very difficult. So what we have been doing right now is we ignored <laughs> conveniently the problem of semantics and we basically went ahead and said, oh, I have an image. I first used that image to project to the latent code, and then I used that for editing, right? So I'm kind of, I circumvented this problem of, oh, this conditional GAN problem. Um, I don't, I didn't train a conditional GAN yet, right? I, it's just, I circumvented it by traversing the manifold. And that, the problem right now is still that in the latent space, we still don't have any semantics, right? Like. The, the pose, for instance, the presence of a glass and stuff like that. Um, there was a pretty cool paper, InfoGAN. Um, you should have a look at it. They, they, they're kind of proposing how you can learn this in a very efficient way if you don't have labels, for instance. Um, yeah, in most cases, you don't have labels available. That's, that's a big problem. Um, so you need some sort of unsupervised disentanglement of the representation. And the, and the way you do this in practice is you just do some clustering. That's what we always do, right? If you don't have data, we, we do some clustering. Um, Traditionally, we've always <laughs> done it with the PCA. Um, yeah, nowadays you would use an autoencoder or something like that and, and, and then say, oh, what are your major clusters in your latent spaces and so on, right? Um, but yeah, nonetheless, mapping semantics to the latent space is, is very, very tricky and um, yeah, still an un, unsolved problem, of course. Okay, um, but I wanna, I wanna quickly discuss that part a little bit, <laughs> the labels. Um, uh, labels is a big problem. Um, of course, um, and there's no difference in the conditional case because we have kind of these two settings now. We have settings where we do have paired data and we do have unpaired data. Um, and this is this terminology of paired versus unpaired is something you might want to remember. Um, in the paired setting, we could go ahead and train like a network that maps me from this cat to that cat. Right? We have the sketches and the cat image. This is a pair. Uh, Right? And we have all kind of pairs here between the sketches and the images. Um, there's also an unpaired version where we don't have that. If you have horses and zebras, this is an unpaired setting. And most of the time we're in this setting actually. But often we can make shortcuts and kind of fall back to the paired setting. So if we have paired data, um, a lot of things get easier. But often we don't have it. Um, in the following I would like to take um, yeah, I would like to, to present two of the methods that people have been doing for, for either cases. So I wanted to look at the paired setting first. A big question is, how do we get to the paired setting? Um, a paired setting means, hmm, yeah, you know, like how do, I, how, do I, how do I know when I have a sketch, how do I get to the cat? Right, do I have to, do I have to draw a sketch and then go to the internet and search the real world image? Um, yeah, no, of course not, you would do it the other way around, right? I'm gonna go ahead and start with a cat, start of the filter that gives me the edges, right? That's how you do it. And um, paired settings for the most time doesn't mean that we annotated them manually. Paired setting for the most time means that we can in a self-supervised way infer the labels. Um, most time, not always. Uh, I wanted to show a couple of examples. Um, and this is a paper, this is this pix to pix paper, image to image translation. This is a paper that precisely focuses on the paired setting. Right? Um, they want to consider specifically these cases. And yeah, they have a couple of examples actually. They have, have quite a comprehensive um, uh, set of samples here. And what they do is they have labels, of, they have image uh, generation measures that go from labels to scenes. Uh, in this case, they uh, take semantic labels uh, on cityscapes, there's a data set, right? And they're turning a network to turn this one into that one. In this case, they have actual annotations. So there's people that have annotated cityscapes, they have semantic labels for it, um, and yeah, there's basically a one-to-one -one mapping between those two. And there's other things like aerial maps. This is from Google Maps. 
Um, here you're gonna have the satellite photos versus the, the you know, the abstractions from the maps visualizer. Um, here you, you have it implicitly given because at some point, probably Google Maps also has a method that goes from a satellite image and produces these ones. So for that one, we have a lot of free data available, right? This is also free. Um, day night images. In this case, you have to make sure you have the cameras are being aligned. So the image is taking the same stuff. Um, and then you have one-to-one -one maps and you just take the images at a different time. Um, black and white is super, uh, grayscale images, right? And color image is super easy. I'm just gonna take a color image. I'm gonna convert it to grayscale. I have these pairs. And then I can train a network that goes from grayscale to the other side. Um, sketches we mentioned, right? You take typically that one here as input, you convert it to a sketch. This way it works, the other way around is a bit harder. Okay, but let's have a look at this one here. Um, yeah, I wanted to go back to this case, what we discussed before. How would we how would we train this conditional networks here? And if you're looking at, at the traditional formulation by Goodfellow, right? Um, we have in here um, what we're trying to do. We have a discriminator, we have a generator, um, trying to maximize a discriminator and minimize the generator, right? So these two, they fight each other. Um, we have a binary cross entropy loss, right? Again, we want to make sure um, our generator here produces stuff that he thinks um, is beating the discriminator. Um, and the discriminator wants to make sure it's, he's always right. right? But these are the two things that come, uh, fight each other. Um, we've done this for random variable z. We fed this into a generator, got an image out of it, have a discriminator. Discriminant tells us it's real or is it not real. Um, again, this one gives us a manifold. Um, we've discussed like manifold traversal and stuff like this. Um, but the problem what we had is, well, when we are feeding in here, um, okay, so same formulation here. When we're feeding in here, uh, this sketch of a bag have a generator that takes this maybe through an encoding as input, um, generates a real output here, discriminator says it's real or fake, let's say it's real. Um, we're gonna have this issue that no matter what we generate here, each of these ones will be true, right? And the reason is the discriminator just checks, does whatever we're doing here as an output, is that part of our distribution, right? of the real distribution. But the discriminator doesn't care about whatever we're feeding in here. So in other words, if you're training this, the generator eventually will maybe use that for random seed, but it will not it will not cover the, the edges or semantics or whatsoever, right? Well, why would he? Wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that. Okay, the, the core idea is, the, uh, the core problem here is that this discriminator doesn't know about this guy. Uh, this is something we have to fix. And the easiest way to fix it, we just make the discriminator aware of it. And that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna take this input and we have two images now. One is what we generate here with our generator and what we have uh, what we have fed as input. And now we have the discriminator takes the pair here as input. This is why it's a paired setting that way. This is where the term comes from. Uh, now we have a pair between the sketch and the generated output. And the discriminator needs to decide is this pair good together or not. It's not just, is that a real image, but it's also, is it a real pair that would exist in the training set? Um, in this case, well, this is our, what our fake pair, right? This is our fake pair. Our discriminator takes now X is the image, sorry, uh, X is the, uh, the, the conditional image, X is the conditioning, and G is what we generate. And this pair, both of them is fed into the discriminator. Um, yeah, this is the fake pair. Um, and of course we have a real pair here too. And this is why we need ground truth here. This is why we need the paired ground truth data, what we've previously discussed, right? The discriminator now needs to get both X and Y as input, right? Discriminator checks, is this real of course, but it also checks, is it belonging to that sketch here? These two things need to work. Uh, because our generator doesn't do anything here, this one will be of course true. Um, this is always a real one, but this case we wanna, wanna make sure that we're generating something that matches to this one here. Yeah, and now, what, what, our, our, what our GAN is learning, this, con this is now a true conditional GAN because it's conditioned on X and it wants to generate something um, that matches to X, right? In this case, we wanna, we wanna match the joint distribution, right? We wanna make sure that the distribution of real pairs matches the pairs what we are just generating. Okay, um, yeah, that's the, the whole idea basically. Um, but very importantly, we need to make sure that the discriminator is aware of of these pairs, right? That the conditioning needs to be fed into the discriminator. Otherwise, 
there's no way of making sure that our pairs, what we're generating, are actually real pairs or not, or are good pairs or not. Okay, um, and this is what this picks to picks paper is doing. And I think, again, this is a very, a very important paper um, because they introduced this concept of um, uh, conditioning the, the discriminator with it, right? And what we're doing here is, again, we have here X is our conditioning. We have a generator, practically generates the encoder decoder architecture, takes this image here as input, goes to latent space, goes back to decoder, um, generates something as output. This one is just being forwarded. Discriminator takes these two here as input and has a binary cross entropy. Is it real or is it fake? Um, this one is typically an encoder architecture, of course, right? And it's just a classifier. Um, again, we have to make sure discriminate and generate are roughly the same size. Um, but in this case, um, we compare it against uh, a real world pair. Uh, so we have here uh, y and x are being compared to each other. Good. Um, yeah, so I think this is really cool. Um, this is, of course, um, now the first time where we're training a manifold that is conditioned on pairs. Um, in this case, we have this paired setting, right? So what we need, we need these pairs in the ground truth data. This is what we need for training. We need these pairs. Uh, for images to edges, um, yeah, there's this data set um, by Xi and Tu. Um, basically, you have these pairs. That's what they train it on. Practically, what you do is you would start here from the, uh, from the image and generate the edges. That one you can probably do algorithmically. Or you hire a bunch of artists that would do... Uh, like sketching for that. Um, both is an option. Ideally, you want to do it self-supervised. You don't want to hand annotate it, right? Okay, this one goes from edges to images. Um, yeah, the paired setting is kind of a very popular one. Um, it's great when we have free data. Um, I like to call it self-supervised. Um, in, in practice, um, the paired setting is always self-supervised, right? You, you, you really want to, want to annotate like a specific setting. Um, but yeah, think about these settings. I think this is cool. I think this one we've just shown you, right? The sketches to images. Th that's an easy one. Um, there's a couple of data sets like these. Um, yeah. Anyway, there, there's many of these ones. And the self-supervised case, uh, I mentioned like grayscale, black and white and stuff like this is, is interesting. Um, there's, a cool, <laughs> there's a cool demo actually. You should go to this website, afinelayer.com, uh, pixsrv. Um, and here you can basically go ahead and do your sketches, run picks to picks. They just wrap the picks to picks model, and then you're getting some outputs, right? Um, here you have a cat. The model is trained on cats, on cat pairs. You're gonna get this as output. You can try pretty cool things. Uh, <laughs> looks like that. <laughs> you can try, um, yeah, to have arbitrary shapes here. Um, your picks to picks model will try to fit these arbitrary shapes in here, right? Um, I think it's cool. I think you can play around with it. This is an interactive demo. You can just go to the website and, and try it out yourself. Um, yeah, it looks like that, right? You first draw the cat. Um, you get this as an output. Uh, you can get <laughs> pretty funky shapes if you're doing various things. Um, I have tried the two. Uh, in the previous lectures, I did this live. Um, my drawing skills are pretty bad, um, but I think you should try it out. It's, it's kind of fun to, to do it. Okay, this is for edges to Edges to cats, right? This was a model that was trained specifically on cats. Um, there's models, um, self-supervised data from Google. I mentioned that. You can take Google Maps. You have the satellite images. Uh, you can train models that go from here to here. Um, yeah, interestingly enough, this is the ground truth. One thing you will see very quickly is, in these cases, how do you expect... This is an under-constrained problem, I think, in practice, right? Like, you don't really know... Um, yeah, I don't know. You don't necessarily know, like what are the, what are the, what is the ground truth? There's probably multiple multiple solutions that would give you a good image for that input here, right? Um, looks plausible. If you're zooming in, you will see there's a lot of artifacts, but on the on the high level, it looks pretty plausible. Okay, you have the grayscale stuff. The one I mentioned, input here, training the output. You get actually kind of good results. Um, but again, grayscale is also under constraint. You don't know for sure. Um, how they really looked like. Um, but yeah, I think it looks pretty pretty cool. Um, there's a few ideas behind picks to picks I wanted to mention. Um, and it's not just this conditional GAN that we've just set. In practice, what they do is you're training also an L1 loss, right? Um, you have a lambda parameter that says, 
yeah, get, go from this image, go to this target. This would be an L1 loss. Um, typically you have some weight on this one and this weight is actually still a dominant weight. Um, what you can do is you can actually get rid of the generator, uh, the discriminator loss, just have the generator with L1 um, and then successively make this weight here, sorry, successively reduce this weight here, right? This is one thing that makes picks to picks more constrained and probably that's why it works relatively well. Um, they have a unit architecture. They have skip connections to preserve the structure in the generator. Makes sense for some cases. For other cases, you wouldn't want to do that. But for these cases, we've just seen here, it makes a lot of sense. Like for grayscale images, totally makes sense. You want to preserve the structure, makes sense. Um, there's a few interesting things about picks to picks. Um, there's no latent variable Z in this case. They use dropout for noise. So you just have a dropout variable. You run the network multiple times to get different results. Um, one problem, what always happens if you train Z GANs, if you're feeding in a vector Z, um, it tends to ignore this random variable. That's what I said already before. If you don't have a paired setting and you're just feeding in the sketch and have a generator, uh, you, won't, you will just ignore the input. It's just not gonna, gonna consider it. Um, yeah, the noise is pretty important here because you still wanna have a probabilistic model for many cases. Um, not for all cases. It depends a little bit how constrained your problem is. If, you, if you're having an over-constrained problem, meaning that there's a, there's a specific solution you would expect for that, for that input. But you have things like sketches, well, or this Google Maps images, right? Like there's many solutions that are probably okay. So in this case, you always wanna have a probabilistic model, otherwise your network will just take the average, right? If you just take the average, then you're a bit, it doesn't look so great. So um, typically you wanna have a probabilistic model here. Um, yeah, pix to pix had a few other ideas. Um, one of them is that the L1 or L2 loss, in this case they use an L1 loss, is, is good for the low frequency details. Um, and then the idea is that the GAN kind of locally on a per patch level uh, figures out the high frequency details. So what they did is also they introduced a patch GAN version. So this model that I just shown you um, is actually fully convolutional, right? So both discriminator and generator um, are fully convolutional. Um, the reason why this works is because you don't have a latent vector, right? So you, you can, whatever input you're feeding in is the same size as the output. So it's fully convolutional, only conf operators. Um, but the generator um, produces basically patches, sorry, <laughs> the discriminator is basically only being applied to certain patches. Right? You have a patch size, like how much the, generator, uh, the discriminator actually sees. Um, it won't help you to generate global structure. But since it's a condition problem, the structure you can simply preserve with an L1 or L2 loss and with the skip connections. Because of that, this patch gain makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's a lot easier to train than generating a high resolution output. Uh, from scratch, you can take a high resolution input, you have the patches on a smaller resolution, and the GAN tells you, is this a reasonable patch with a reasonable amount of detail and stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah, I should say, whenever you're doing a thesis or like a guided research and stuff like this or project, I would always recommend start with this picks to picks code for generative models. Um, this is a really clean code base. Um, these guys spend a lot of effort in making it actually usable. This is a very, very popular GitHub page. Um, I would recommend, um, I always recommend people to start with that. This is always a very good baseline, even though results don't look perfect, but it's relatively easy to use. Yeah, there's been a lot of work already on uh, as a follow-up. Uh, one work is pix to pix HD. Now they're saying, oh yeah, we're trying to do similar ideas um, like multi-resolution and stuff like that, or multi-scale um, on top of pix to pix The idea now is you have a coarse defined generator. Don't just have a single patch, but go ahead and say, go coarse first and then go, go into more details. Same thing for the discriminator. Um, the idea here is that the generators and discriminators are the same, but since they operate on different re resolutions, they get different receptive fields. Um, yeah, in practice, it looks something like that. So you have here, um, you have here a generator, it goes from semantic labels, right? Um, produces <coughs> some feature maps. At the same time, you can downsample the input, again, have a bunch of resonant blocks, produces some feature maps, 
Now we have the decoder that goes to the resulting image at the lower resolution. Um, these features at the lower resolution are now concatenated to the features of the higher resolution. You have a bunch of residual blocks here and you go up to the original image, right? So you have kind of a network in a network here. Like in between the network, we have, a, we have another residual block. It's very similar to progressive growing, actually. It's a very similar idea, um, except it's a conditional network now. And you have now, you have conditions at this level and you have conditions at this level, right? So that is also helping to make it easier. In this case, pix to pix HD is using multi-scale discriminators. Um, in this case, they're using three. Um, I think this is pretty arbitrary in a sense. Um, I think they just did it because that's what they fit best in their GPU. Um, so yeah, there's basically various combinations of stacking, discriminator, and generator. I'm not arguing this is the best version, but these guys spend a reasonable effort in getting good results, right? So, um, so there's a lot of optimizations you can still do, but it's still similar to this progressive GAN idea, right? So you say you have lower resolution and then you upsample and go to higher resolution. Um, there is an interesting question though, is basically, if I'm quickly going back, <laughs> Um, you have a very interesting thing that a lot of people uh, often don't mention. Um, so in a sense, what you do is, right, you, you're designing your architecture such that it fits more or less on your GPU. So now you're having two, two options. One option is I'm going to say I have a single hierarchy level and I'm going to put all my weights into the single hierarchy level. The second option is I have multiple hierarchy levels, but each hierarchy level will have a smaller number of weights because no matter what I have a fixed budget of weights or of capacity that I can fit on my GPU. The argument is now that by having this multi-resolution, multi-scale hierarchy, it's more efficient to use the weights. That's eventually going to be the high level argument we have to make. Um, and this is what they're showing and it seems pretty reasonable for their setting. Again, they're using three levels. They have basically uh, three discriminators and three generators there. Right? Okay, they get results that look like these. Um, this is a synthesized image already from, again, this is Cityscapes uh, image. Um, yeah, it looks, looks pretty decent, right? I mean, look, looks not too bad um, from a detail. Um, you can zoom in here, but I think the number signs are still pretty blurry um, for the better for the worse, but you can see that it's not, it's not quite perfect. Um, they have done it on faces. So here's a face mask as input. Right, and then they're synthesizing different uh, results for the faces. Again, it doesn't look perfect, like the teeth here or so, are not perfect. It looks, it looks pretty decent. Um, here's another example. This is an interactive one, so they run it multiple times for the same image, right? So they're getting different results. You can look at the number plates, it looks kind of funny. Text is super hard, right? I mean, <laughs> paint like a lot of small scale detail of, them, of these signs here, right? They also. <laughs> It's not perfect, not perfect, but uh, it's getting there, right? Just give it, give it a few more years, we're getting better. Yeah, anyway, this is one of the latest papers. There's, there's a few more papers, of course, but this is one of them, like this pix to pix line, I think is pretty, pretty popular and I, um, I can highly recommend looking at that one. Good, um, so far we have looked at the paired setting um, and I already mentioned we need to get the pairs, right? We need labels and so on. And it is expensive to collect the pips. However, there's also scenarios where it's virtually impossible to collect pairs. So let's say we want to convert our horses into zebras, right? How does our horse look as a zebra? I, this is very difficult. Do you want to go ahead and, and catch a bunch of horses and paint them in zebra stripes? Might be difficult to get enough training data like that, right? So that's, <laughs> that's a very difficult problem. So this leads us to the unpaired setting. Like again, picks to picks in these kind of things, conditional GANs for paired settings. But now how do we do conditional GANs in the unpaired setting? Right? Um, so, and that is actually a very common case. We will see this later. Um, there's a couple of interesting scenarios where this happens um, a couple of times. So in the unpaired setting, you have stuff like that, right? You have a bunch of images of, of horses, you have a bunch of images of zebras, but between those two, there's no, there's no direct correlation, right? I don't know how this horse would look as a zebra. I also don't know how this zebra would look as a horse. Again, I can't paint them so easily. I can't go ahead and paint this guy as a zebra. Um, so I have a source domain X and I have a target domain Y. Um, 
I know which one is which, but I don't have one-to-one -one maps. And this is the unpaired setting. So how would we formulate a conditional GAN in the unpaired setting? Um, well, what you can do is, let's, let's do the same thing and start naively, right? Um, let's say we start with an image from the domain X, right? This is a horse. Um, we're feeding into a generator. Um, and then we have our discriminator, right? Our discriminator takes now this guy here. It, it wants to generate this one here, um, but it doesn't have the input output pairs, right? And this one should say real or not real. So what you could do is you could simply go ahead and say, oh, let's ignore this part at all again. Um, and let's say our generator generates something that, sorry, our discriminator says, is this from the zebra domain? I'm just going to go take horse, feed in the generator, um, produce anything from the target domain zebra. And the discriminator says, is it from zebra? It says real. Uh, we're going to have the same problem what, what I discussed before in the parent setting already. Like we like this in this case is both real. The discriminator will say, great, both look like zebras. You're all good to go. Um, so the GAN does not force any correlation here between those two. Same thing what we've discussed with the cats, same thing for horses and zebras, right? Now, the question is, how do we figure out there's some correlation between these? That is the big question. And, well, one idea, what you could do is you could say, well, I have a bunch of horses here, um, and I train this network that I just described. The most likely output you would actually get is you would get some mode collapse because everything would map to the same target and everything here would be part of our real domain in the target. Now, how do we, if we had a way to figure out, to force that this guy here, that you, if we had a way to figure out to avoid mode collapse, in other words, if we had a way to say this image, this image, and this image should all map to a zebra image, but these images must be different. So in other words, we want to have a bijective mapping. We want to have a mapping that goes from here to one image. This one goes from one image to here. This one goes to one image to here. And precisely only one of them goes here. Um, and the idea is of a bijective mapping that we have a one-to-one -one map from here to here and from here to here. So if we had a bijective mapping, we could force to avoid the mod collapse. And the idea to do that is a cycle consistency approach. So the idea is we have images from X, we have images from Y. The idea is that if I map from X to Y, I have a discriminator that tells me, hey, I'm from Y. And the idea now is that we're taking that same image and mapping it back. And this is the original image again. Um, and this is actually a thing that people have been doing for language quite a bit. There's actually this famous approach from Mark Twain, right? Um, where you're saying, if you're translating from language A to language B, you should, and then from B back to A, you should get the same result, right? And this is literally enforcing a bijective mapping if you're doing that, right? Again, if you're translating from, in this case, English to French, and then from French back to English, you hope that you get the same sentence as output. If not, something went wrong, something got lost in the translation, right? Same thing for the image. This is image translation, but unpaired. Um, and the way you're doing this, it is a cycle consistency loss. So what we do is we have, again, we have domain X here, horses here. We have a generator that maps this guy to a zebra. So this generator takes X, this image here as input and produces Y hat. Right? Generator takes X input, produces Y hat. Discriminator here tells us I'm a zebra or not a zebra. Okay, so X maps to Y. And then what we're doing is we're mapping this one back. Now, we have another generator, F, again, note that F and G are both generators. This one maps Y hat back to X hat. And then all we're doing is we're checking, did we get the same input? Uh, did, we, did we get the same result that we fit in? Um, in this case, you can just use an L1 norm, right? You, you literally want to have the same image again. So again, feeding X in, mapping to domain Y, mapping back to domain X should give you the same image. That's the core idea of the cycle consistency, right? It's forcing a bijective mapping. Um, and you don't know necessarily what Y was, but the idea is if you're doing this over the large distribution, 
it forces that not the same image X maps to the same image in Y. Right? In other words, if you're doing this one here again, so this is what I mentioned with this mod collapse. So let's say here we have, um, we have horses here. They could all map to the zebras, right? And if all of them map to the zebras, to the same zebra image here, right? if all of them map to the same thing, um, I would go back with this F generator um, and I would get the same image here as output. Now my cycle loss would tell me, hey, this one looks great. This is and this and this image is the same. But my cycle loss would tell me this to this and this to that, they don't look very good, right? So we have a bit of a problem here. This is a high loss. And that's good for us because what we want to do is we want to split these apart. We want to say, oh, they cannot map to the same image because if they do that, these losses here will be very high. And this is good for us. So the cycle consistency makes sure we have a true bijective mapping, or at least we're trying to have a true bijective mapping. Okay, um, yeah, we're doing it the other way around too, of course. Uh, we're doing it in both directions. So now if we have a zebra and we're mapping it to a horse with our F generator, F goes from uh, zebras to horses, we're getting X hat here. We have a discriminator that tells us, oh, it's a horse. Um, and then we're mapping it back with G and G gives us Y hat. And this is a zebra again, right? Again, note that this generator and this generator here is both the same. These, these two are trained at the same time. Um, and when we're mapping it back here, we're comparing again, is that image again the same as this image, right? This one here and this one, these should match. This is our cycle. So in this case, again, we do a simple reconstruction error saying, if we're feeding the zebra Y in, applying F, now we have a horse, and now we're applying G again, now we should get a zebra again, we should get the very same image again. Uh, what we fed in here in the input, right? And these two losses we train at the chain at the same time, right? This is two cycles. We go both ways. Um, and note again, this F and this F is the same. This G and this G is the same, right? Um, and the uh, lower case X and lower case Y are the respective training samples, right? Um, DG is the discriminator tells me, oh, it's a horse, and DY tells me, oh, it's a zebra. Okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And now we're training all of them together. Uh, we can already see how many losses do we have, right? We have one cycle loss in this direction, one cycle loss in that direction, and we have the two discriminators. That's basically what we have. Okay, well, now we have generator that goes from A to B, this one here, and we have generator, uh, oh yeah, there's another A to B. Huh, there's two A to Bs here. I'm not sure why this slide has two A to Bs. Anyway, but if you're doing this, we're getting results that look like these ones. Um, a little bit funny. <laughs> this looks funny, right? Now we have this horse that is a zebra. This horse is also a zebra. And this is kind of the results you're getting. Uh, you can do this with horses and zebras. You can do this with painting styles. Here are Monet paintings. They can be mapped to real photos, right? This is a real photo now from a Monet painting. We can do another Monet painting to another real photo. Looks like that. We can do photos here as input. Um, we can change, I think, the, the, uh, the seasons, I think, right? Go in here between seasons. We can go here the other way around. This one, I actually don't remember what they trained it on, but you, have, you get the idea, right? Um, you basically have oranges, you wanna make apples out of them, or you have oranges where you wanna make apples out of it, right? That's the core idea. Um, yeah, I think that was mainly what I wanted to go through um, in this lecture. Um, we have talked a lot right now about conditional GANs. We have talked about architectures for GANs. Um, I think this is really interesting because now we have actually control over the GANs and we can do something with them, right? We can turn horses into zebras. I think that's amazing. And there's still a few things um, that we haven't discussed yet. Generatively speaking, we can do stuff on images. Um, one thing I would like to talk about, especially in the next lecture, is videos, right? How do we go and, and make now videos out of it? Um, this is also something that, that my group does um, quite a bit. Um, we do a lot of stuff in neural rendering and in 3D deep learning. So these are the things um, we're, gonna, we're gonna cover in the next lectures. So yeah, I hope you still have fun <laughs> working on the projects. Um, please take the opportunity to spend your effort with it. 
um, yeah, let, let us know um, if there's any questions and so on. Yeah, otherwise, um, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, see you for the next lecture. Thanks a lot.